I'm Bonnie Fong, the board chair for the Chinese American Service League. I am pleased to welcome you to our Food and Thought web series. For over 40 years, the Chinese American Service League has been providing vital services to the community, from assisting immigrants in their dreams of American citizenship, by providing daycare and childhood education services, by caring for our elderly, and so much more. CASEL works to enable, inspire, and empower our families by providing essential programs and services. Food and thought consists of two basic elements, a demonstration from a local chef and an interview with a local business and community leader. Through these thoughtful and entertaining programs, we hope to help further important discussions and explore topics that affect us all. I want to thank all of our guest speakers, our moderators, Judy Su and Judy Wang, our chefs and their establishments for their demonstrations, and the organizations that have supported us in putting this program together. I want to express a special thanks to Bank of America as the premier sponsor for the Food and Thought web series. For over two decades, Bank of America has supported Castle programs, making a difference in the lives of thousands of Chicagoans in need. We thank them for their continued commitment to serve the greater Chicagoland community. Finally, I want to thank all of you for joining us. Your support makes it possible for us to provide vital services to those in need. Please visit castleservice.org to learn more about our programs and how you can help. Now, on with the show. When it comes to finances, people have all kinds of questions. My wedding and my emergency fund are my, my two top priorities right now. That's why we created Better Money Habits, financial education to help anyone turn I don't know into let's go. With articles, videos, and tools about everything from budgeting and home ownership to credit and retirement, people can get free, objective, and actionable guidance. Developed by Bank of America experts, based on what matters most to you, that anyone can access. It all adds up to hundreds of unique resources to help navigate important financial topics served up in a way that works for you, online and in person. Plus, thousands of our employees volunteer as Better Money Habits champions in their communities. They're all ways to answer the questions that matter. What would you like the power to do? These truly have been extraordinary times for our community. And I just want to take a moment to thank everybody watching our food and thought right now and say thank you because your support for the community has been incredible through all of this. So now we're going to transition to family foundations and look at how philanthropy has shifted. Foundations really stepping up to help our local nonprofits. And one of those great foundations is the Julian Gray's Foundation. So now let me introduce my guest here today. Jessica Sarowitz is the Managing Family Director of the Julian Gray's Foundation. And when she is not busy with that, and that keeps her pretty busy, she is also the managing partner of the 4S Bay Partners. And that is a family office management company that oversees several private businesses. Jessica has a very busy schedule. So we want to say, first of all, thank you, Jessica, for taking the time out to join us for Food and Thought today. I want to thank Castle for uh, the invitation of being here today. And also, I want to thank you, Judy, for uh, your presence and uh, being a part of this program. Once again, I'm Jessica Sarowitz, and I represent Forest Bay Partners and also the Julian Grace Foundation. Um, in regards to the Julian Grace Foundation, we are an entrepreneurial, high engagement, grant making, um, you know, foundation. And what that means is uh, we, we're very, we spend a lot of time trying out new things. Um, we're very responsive and we're, you know, we like to really focus on what's important um, with community. And so we also lean into eliminating prejudices related to gender, race, faith, 
and other intersectionalities that would prevent, you know, everyday people from living, you know, an, an equitable and meaningful life. So that's what we do. Um, and we're very fortunate that being a family office, we have the ability to um, leverage the expertise that we have within both the family office side, the Forest Bay side, which is more of a private sort of commercial uh, focus and the Julian Grace Foundation. Um, so I wanna pass along some numbers for everybody in 2020, of course, going through the very difficult time of the pandemic, Julian Grace granted an additional $2.1 million in responsive grants, an additional $1.5 million to initiatives related to COVID-19, particularly in the greater Chicago area. I, I guess I have two questions here. One, if you can talk about what a responsive grant is and also how has the pandemic shifted giving priorities uh, for you, for Julian Grace? A responsive grant is a very agile grant, meaning that it has to respond to the needs of now. And when the pandemic first hit in March, April, when it got really, really crazy for all of us in 2020, um, we recognized at the Julian Grace Foundation and also at Forest Bay that community needed an immediate response, particularly in the areas of healthcare, or COVID related, um, you know, uh, sort of things that they needed uh, in order to operate. We needed an immediate response when it comes to food needs having to do with making sure that people had access to food and also um, making sure that they had secure housing. So what we did is we reached out immediately to our grantee partners. And the first thing we asked is, are you okay? Um, you know, do you have everything you need in order to do the mission work and provide the critical services that the communities need? And what we heard was, um, thank you for, you know, being here. And we don't even know, you know, what to do right away. And we said, don't worry, we've got you. We're gonna make sure that um, you have funds available immediately so that you can start addressing this and you don't have to worry. Um, so that's what I mean by responsive grant making is just in a crisis mode, you have to respond now. You have to do it in an agile way and you have to do it now. Another area of concern for our grantee partners was just payroll. Could they make payroll? Um, it wasn't just, you know, were they gonna get funds, but how do you even move the funds when um, your staff is virtual? They can't come into the office. We, you know, you haven't set up the protocols that are needed to make sure that everyone is safe. And um, so what we did is we scrambled on our end and it wasn't easy. I can tell you that in my accounting team, uh, we had a scramble. We had to figure out how do we do things in a completely different way because um, we had to move money uh, automatically. And in some cases, we needed documentation from banks in order to move the money. It sounds crazy, um, but the kind of funds that we move, that's what's needed or we had to open up new bank accounts um, just to transfer money from one place to another. Thank goodness, like I said before, that we have the expertise in-house and people that are deeply committed to doing the mission work uh, on, on both uh, the Julian Grace side and Forest Bay Partners so we could respond quickly and, and, and provide and move those funds for our, our grantee partners. In terms of charitable giving, let's talk a little bit about that. I know it's been a big part of your life, a big part of the family. Um, on a personal level, I wonder if you can just talk to us about how, how important is giving? I, I guess two twofold. You know, one at the foundation level in helping out our nonprofits and our communities, but also, you know, personally. 
because I know for us, the station, we do a lot of stories with food pantries um, and we talk about the need for hunger uh, over the pandemic, which is, has been tremendous. And that the, you know, they always stress that every dollar matters, every you know, minute that volunteers can give truly matter. So your, your perspective on giving you know, at the foundation level and also personally. On the foundation level, it's really important to us to make sure that we show up for community in the right way. And for the foundation, what that means, especially in the year 2020, um, you know, we, we scrambled, our board scrambled. And, you know, what we did was we said the, the money that we usually give out because we usually have two cycles in a year and it's very, you know, process of application, uh, analysis, review, we meet with the uh, grantees. Well, that all, that's not enough. So what we did was we had about five cycles of giving within that year. So we more than doubled what we normally do in terms of giving money out. Um, so that was one level. Another level was understanding that we needed to give out more money. And uh, um, I, I'll give you an example. In 2019, we gave out about 4.5 million in 2020, we gave out approximately 9 million. Um, and in 2021, we uh, gave out uh, 10 million. Now we are a small staffed family foundation. So it does come with a lot of work, a lot of hard work. We did hire new people because we made that commitment. And I'm, I'm very proud to say that our board understood this, that this was uh, a time of crisis and we were deeply committed to these communities because we're all from these communities. Uh, the staff is from these communities. I'm, I'm an immigrant, I understand. Um, and, you know, a lot of the people that work at Forest Bay also have family and friends um, from community and they understood how critical it was to respond. So on the foundation level, it was extremely important to us. Personally, um, what giving means to us and our family is it anchors our core value, you know, in our core, we anchor it in our core values. We are anchored in giving you know, just treating people with dignity and respect. Um, and the core value that we have as a family that, um, you know, we want to respond in a way that's ethical, that, um, you know, is, is something that people want to receive this sort of uh, whatever assistance it is. And it's not just money. It could also be just listening um, to what is rising up, just listening to maybe some of the trauma that they experienced. And we do that as well in, within our family because we, we understand that there's diverse ways to tackle a problem and that um, we have to honor everyone by inviting them to participate and give their feedback or ideas on what, what we can do and in a crisis, it is vitally critical that we reach out and invite people and, and say, yes, we're gonna be part of this um, sort of team or group that will tackle this problem. We have to leverage not only our money, uh, we have to leverage our expertise in terms of professional skill set, And we have that at the family office. And what I mean by that is we've got uh, folks there that do legal work. We have, um, people that are experts in investments uh, or how to structure, um, you know, the capital stack so that people can actually afford to uh, run their entrepreneurial businesses. And we, and we have, we own entrepreneurial businesses, so we understand the scale of growth and what is involved along all of these different steps of growth. Um, so we have people that, that are experts in that. We have people that are, you know, really good at moving funds around just from an accounting perspective and um, making sure that we have good budgets and so on and so forth. So every 
person within um, Forest Bay and also the Julian Grace Fund Foundation, that mission, we have a mission component embedded in our job descriptions. So everyone knows that every once in a while, maybe we are called upon to uh, respond to a nonprofit that might need a little bit of help, maybe, in, you know, maybe some member of their staff left um, and they just want us to go in there and look over some, um, some you know, financial uh, information and we help them with that. Or it could be they're trying to find a lease to a certain, you know, a, a new place where they want to um, run a facility and we'll take a look at the, the contract. So whatever it is that, that is important to them, um, we try to be a resource for them. So there's that component. And um, we always love to attend events that are sponsored by our grantee partners. And um, a lot of our board members attend um, and staff attend. So, um, you know, it's a joy to be able to do that as well and, and be a part of that and bring our friends um, to these events and support, you know, fundraising efforts and so on. Traditionally, what the Julian Grace Foundation does under this high engagement grant making is really work with the nonprofits, our grantee partners and community to think around what can we do to improve the way in which the mission work is done? And it, it is reflected in what we call capacity building or, capa or, or giving funds for capacity building, meaning it could be something like they need new software. Um, in, in a, in a, our grantee partner needs new software. It could be that the staff need new training um, or some kind of equipment, some other kind of equipment, so or consulting kind of assistance. If you know, under uh, 2020 and 2021, we kind of shifted our giving more towards uh, responsive grant making or um, helping with what is needed now in critical spaces of healthcare, food, and um, also, you know, uh, education and so on. Now, as we come into 2022, we're going to slowly shift once again and help nonprofits with capacity building because we are now in this recovery mode in the pandemic. Um, and what we're hearing is now rising in community is the need for um, assistance for staff um, in the nonprofits so that they can have other kind of training um, maybe some sort of healing type of training because um, there's, there's been a lot of trauma um, that staff have also experienced in responding to community needs and um, mental health services um, that are needed not only in community but also with staff as well. I mean, this is the truth. So we're now shifting more of our dollars to go in, in that way. And that's what we're hearing is rising and that's how we listen and we respond to what is really needed in community and our grantee partners. It, it, Jessica, you were so right in talking about leveraging the expertise at the foundation level and collectively um, sharing that knowledge with the nonprofit partners. But I do wanna ask you, on a personal level, uh, how does it impact you? How do you feel um, about the work that you're able to do with the foundation and, and really helping to meet the critical needs of our community? On a personal level, it in, you know giving impacts me because it's it's really a, a way for me to I'm going to be honest to lead a lead a meaningful life <laughs> and. I really get jazzed by being in community and listening. I love people. I love the, you know, the diversity of people and thoughts and ideas. So for me, this is, it's, 
it's a joy to do the work. Um, and I also feel, um, you know, cause I'm human as well. I feel the stress, the anxiety, um, and I'm, I'm, and I'm, and I'm trying to walk in solidarity with community. So that's the personal level. Now on the family level, I have two teenage children and, um, they are teenage, you know, they're now they're college students actually. So they're off into their little worlds, but they are very sensitive, I think, or aware of what is happening around them in, in different communities with different issues. They're engaging. They understand and, uh, you know, about the structural inequities that are present in, in our society. They're getting involved in different initiatives and, and issues within our family. We are really blessed in that we all understand how important it is to anchor, you know, our lives and our family's core values and, you know, our deep love and respect for the dignity, the dignity of others, um, the, you know, the, the love and respect to diverse communities. And so we're always uh, talking amongst ourselves about issues that are happening in society that we see as being important that affect the daily lives of people. And, um, you know, it could be, you know, during the pandemic, uh, my kids were very involved in uh, what was happening at school and how some kids didn't have access to um, the internet or laptops or how difficult it was to, um, you know, focus on that and, and focus on your schoolwork when, when a lot of disruption was occurring. So everyone is, what we, what we say is everyone in our family is on their own pathway or their own journey of understanding what it is to be connected to community, to be uh, of service to community, to be good citizens, and um, to lead a meaningful life. Um, so, you know, that's, we're, we're so privileged, we're so blessed, we get to um, be creative in how we um, respond, especially in, in the, from a philanthropic perspective. But, um, you know, it, we receive a lot of joy and blessing by being connected to community. I love that. Um, I do have a couple questions I want to ask on behalf of our community members who may be watching. Um, in, in case they're either thinking about starting a nonprofit or they belong to a small nonprofit and really haven't gone through the grant application process with a foundation, I wonder, because Jessica, you've been doing this for so long, what is your advice for them who may be just starting out on that uh, in that process, that journey that you talked about um, to apply with a foundation and have a relationship with a foundation? When there are newer sort of um, nonprofits that are just starting out with working with a foundation, uh, applying for grants, really the important thing to, to remember is that you have to establish some sort of connection. Just like you have to establish a connection in community, you also have to establish a connection with those that work in a foundation. You have to do your research. What are the focus areas that foundations are currently interested in? Where are they directing their grant dollars to? All of this information is actually public, um, you know, public record on the 990, um, the tax 990. You can find a lot of information out. Sometimes foundations have websites and they're pretty transparent about the sort of uh, nonprofit organizations they give to um, in past grant cycles. So that's another way to sort of understand um, what they're interested in, in, in giving. Really the best thing that you could do is ask for advice and not funds. When you're starting to, to um, establish a relationship with a new foundation. Um, so call someone up in the staff 
and ask for uh, just 15, 20 minutes to run something by them, or maybe they have a resource that they can connect you with. And a lot of times they're willing to do that for you. Um, also, see if you have anyone in your network that is connected to either a staff or a board member, and um, maybe they can, you know, provide you with an introduction. And once again, don't ask for money, but ask for advice. Um, so those are just two tips or two ways that you can, um, you know, connect with the foundation. Judy, I really want to lean into this concept of building relationships. When you are approaching, let's say, some a foundation like Julian Grace Foundation, um, it's important for you to really understand that you're also dealing with um, foundation staff or board members um, that are human. They're people. And the more you know about their background, uh, like for example, I'm an immigrant and I'm multiracial. I have a lot of various interests. So um, I do things in the investment world, filmmaking, uh, philanthropy. Um, I have a deep love for a community. Uh, one of my, you know, interests or deep issue areas is human rights and the rights of immigrants. I'm also very um, interested right now in really advancing the work of diversity, equity, access and inclusion. So, and justice as well. So sometimes people call that Jedi work. Um, you know, so really figure out where is this alignment from what you are doing and what is critically important, critically important to um, the person that you're approaching so that you authentically sort of, you know, have this relationship with the person. Um, and you just discuss things as normal people. And it, it really will help you to build the relationship and when you're dealing with someone who, you know, can provide you with some grant funds, that will, that sort of authentically showing up really um, helps to establish trust. They trust you, you trust them. And hopefully um, if there's alignment in the focus areas, then they can see that you're gonna provide you know, your organization is going to be able to execute and on what you say you're going to execute on behalf of um, helping communities. I, I do have a question as I'm standing here because you mentioned that you're a mom of two teenagers. Um, I have two teenagers and the two younger ones. Um, in terms of giving and right, because it is about it is about having that next generation carrying on. What's the best way to, you know, kind of encourage that next generation to be just a, as involved? One of the things that we, that is really important in our family is to go to different neighborhoods and get to know the people from different neighborhoods. We are so blessed here in Chicago to have different pockets within the city where we have different ethnic groups and there's a lot of cultural richness there's a lot of great food here in Chicago. Um, and people are actually really welcoming when you show up. And they're actually very, in, in some, and sometimes they're really actually really grateful and they wanna share. They wanna talk to you about their culture. They wanna talk to you about um, what's happening in their community, what's exciting for them. And maybe sometimes what's not so, great about what's happening in community. And that doesn't really cost that much. Um, I know that in um, Chicago, they do a great job of having um, opportunities to, you know, um, even if you just go to a library and hang out in a, in a, in a different library, you might see different um, books that are out there. 
um, of different parks. You see people in the parks. I mean, being out in different communities is, is very enriching. And our family has found that to be um, a very joyous thing to do together. Another thing that we have done in our family is to give them their own agency um, with what we thought that they could handle at different um, stages in their young lives. So one example is when they were younger, we would give them just a little bit of money, maybe $30 or $50. And they were able to designate where they wanted that money to go for um, charitable purposes, because it's so, you know, that, that is very important to us to be of service to community. So we wanted them to uh, really think about what's important for them. You know, um, is it jump rope for life? You know, um, you know, sometimes they, they hear things going on in, in school. Is it something to do with the environment, the animals? My son is very uh, connected to, to, to those causes and also the homeless um, issue. My daughter is uh, very connected to issues relating around um, education, educating young women, uh, empower, empowering, empowering women. So they all have their own sort of uh, journey in what they, how they see themselves walking in solidarity with community and what the issues uh, are important, you know, what issues are important to them. We wanna support them in that. So every year we've incre incremented up that amount. And um, one of the results is, um, I'm gonna talk about my daughter now. My son is also do, my, doing other things, but my daughter uh, started a high school youth board and that got supported by the Julian Grace Foundation, the staff there. And, you know, they've told me it was actually really fun to um, work with the youth board and because uh, they see philanthropy through sort of fresh and young, younger sort of eyes. And they were also giving a set of money so that the youth board could go through the whole process of understanding what it's like to be a grant maker and how they have to make tough decisions around you know, where to give, how to research, how to connect to different um, grantee partners. And then um, they have to debate, they have to analyze, they have to figure this out and then um, you know, figure out how they're gonna give the money away. So my daughter moved on into college and now she's about to start a college board. The high school board is still in existence and my daughter just pops in every once in a while and, 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 and lends her support, but it's not run by her anymore or her cohort, because they've all moved on. Now it's run by um, people from diverse areas of our community. So it's an application process. And um, the youth board is, uh, has the agency to decide where their money is gonna go. Um, and uh, the board, the Julian Grace Foundation board, the older people board, um, we get a presentation from the youth board and we have actually said to ourselves, huh, there's something interesting there. And we have actually incorporated one or two of, of I think it's two of their suggestions into our grant making. So it's really fascinating. And I think it's really great to give young people agency. You know, for our family, it was really important to show or role model um, from myself and, and my husband to role model that we believe, we really love being with people. We, we really love um, being in community and we always try to be grateful for whatever role people play in community. And if we receive anything, uh, we receive it with gratitude. We also try to show our love for, um, you know, the connection that we're making, um, our gratitude for the connection we're making, because fundamentally, I think that, um, you know, 
we in our family we see others as as worthy to be loved, worthy to be listened to, and um, also worthy to be of service. And it's really important that we all practice that, especially right now when we're all trying to um, recover from the great sort of trauma that we experienced um, because of the pandemic, because of, um, you know, the great trauma that we experienced around George Floyd and the racial awakening of the structural inequities uh, where more people understood that there were structural inequities that were preventing um, people, especially uh, our African-American brothers and sisters um, from having equitable access to um, you know what is out there so that they can live a meaningful life. I know also that the Asian community had a lot of hateful um, you know messaging and uh, it came out in really terrible ways and it affected them as well. So that, sort of tribalism that needs to stop because that does that's not who we in our court aspire to be as human beings um we aspire to be better and i i truly believe this we as, aspire to show up with care and love and uh cooperation and a level of trust and so when when we all show up that way um, then we can tackle all of these nitty wicked problems that are out there. Your outlook uh, into for philanthropy, you know, going in, in 2021 and a few years beyond, uh, maybe post pandemic, we talked about, you know, the shifting of the giving priorities during this time. What is your outlook for, for giving uh, in the next few years? Gosh, Judy, that is a really good question we are all struggling with what is the path forward? What was done in the past is no longer sufficient. The pandemic, also the, the racial awakening to structural, more structural, you know, to see more structural inequities, that has given us new, the silver lining is we understand that more things have to change and they have to change uh, more quickly. So what we're trying to do now in this recovery mode is reimagine, co-create, um, try to get out of, our, out of our silos and work with more diverse groups and diverse expertise, um, give more agency, give more voice to people, so that they can come to the table and, and, and have a say in how to tackle community problems. Also, we need more accountability and transparency. And as you know, grant makers, we are listening, we are responding to um, you know, what, what does that mean in terms of new ways of doing the work new ways of holding people accountable, new ways of incorporating in process things that will show transparency, things that will show um, that we value others, diverse, the diverse opinions of others, and that we care about each other. So that's the, 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 the reimagining that is occurring in all sectors of our society. And uh, therefore, you know, at the Julian Grace Foundation, we are going to uh, continue to do our high engagement grant making and entrepreneurial grant making and uh, continue to listen and respond to, you know, whatever it is that the grantee partners perceive as being important in this reimagining recovery process. Judy, I also want to talk about what 
Castle is doing because they're being innovators in their space. And uh, they have the Center for Social Impact. And that's a new um, program, you know, within their uh, mission work. What they're doing is using data and uh, data analytics. So they're capturing the data, of what is happening in community? Um, what are the needs? How are they um, actually responding? And they're looking to see, you know, how that can be better incorporated in their processes or inform their process um, so that they can improve their response to the community needs. I think it's really exciting. And I congratulate Castle on uh, leaning into this um, because it's gonna be super important in our, in, um, you know, what's happening um, in our future with uh, all the, you know, different sort of ways in which technology can work on our behalf in a, in a positive way. So uh, congratulations to Castle. I'm super impressed. I'm, I'm, I'm super happy for all the progress that they've made in this, in this regard. I could talk to you for another hour um, and listen to you talk about philanthropy and giving and, and the changing of the landscape. But I'm going to wrap it up right now and say thank you for taking your time out and, and for staying connected with Castle and, and helping Castle become, you know, continue to be a solution in our community. Thank you for, for your outlook. Thank you for your insight, Jessica. I have deep gratitude to Castle, to you, Judy, and thank you for um, the time that I have with you today. Hi, hi, how are you? Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce, uh, I'm from Paramo Restaurant, which is located at 2828 South Wang which is a local community. And this, we are honored today to uh, represent our restaurant and invite it by Castle. And we're gonna, pull, pull, uh, we're gonna do two dishes, perform two dishes to uh, everybody so they can cook at home. Okay, then uh, let me introduce my head chef. His name's Fong, and he's been in, in the kitchen for a long, long time. So he's a very experienced guy. Okay, can we start? First, uh, let's introduce uh, Fong. He's going to introduce, I'm going to translate for him, okay? So how you guys oh, do? hello. Now, we are going to introduce the second dish. The second dish is a sour yam. The sour yam. And we have gonna do chef's gonna do two dishes today. One is gonna salt pepper with the head on shrimp, and then the other one is gonna be a broccoli, American broccoli with the steak. Okay, hey, hey, hey and I wish everybody likes it. Okay, come later, how to go to Chow Chok, the Echo, Chow Sik, uh, Chow Yim Ha, Hai, Chung Kok, the Ho Yau, Taksik, the Ming Toy, the Come, how to go to Chow Yim Ha, Chow Sik, the Echo, Chow Sik, the Echo, Chow uh, we're gonna first perform is the uh, the headland shrimp pan fried stir fried pet headland shrimp from uh, chef, and uh, it's very famous in Hong Kong and China. Come, we're going to buy the market. We bought the half for it. Ah, we're going to get the best of the best. The tail is not dark. Come, we're going to start to tell you how to do it. This tail, this tail is quite thin. It will cause people to hurt. We first have to cut it. We're going 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 to cut it. Okay, first we're gonna purchase the shrimp from the market. Make sure it's fresh. And then how you gonna tell it's fresh is that make sure the head is not black. Okay, and then the, that's gonna be sharp thing and the shrimp's head, you have to cut it off. That's what he's doing. The next step, we're gonna put all the shrimp and we're gonna boil it until it's halfway done. Okay. 
But right now, the shrimp is only halfway cooked. You don't have to cook it like 100%, maybe 80%. Okay, so the shrimp will turn red color. Once the shrimp is 80%, it will turn to this color. Okay, and that, that means it's, uh, it's okay. Okay, we need the chipino, garlic, some uh, red pepper, and then the cilantro. And this will be going with the shrimp, okay? This is from again. Uh, we're gonna prepare the second dish. Chef Fong is gonna prepare the second dish for you guys. Uh, Chef Fong has a special way to cut the steak because a lot of fat. You don't want to cook with it, so you're gonna take off some fat first from the steak. Okay? We're gonna manually the steak a little bit to make it tender. Okay, go ahead. Let's put the steak in there. Let's go ahead and cut it. Let's cut. Nah,呢個就係我哋切好個士的球。咁切好咗之後咧，我哋係要攞啲料係醃一醃佢，等佢更加好味，更加入味嘅。咁啊，有啲唔得黑椒啦。We Uh,要點多個啊,生抽。Uh,soy Okay, the we have uh, sit there, let the stick generate for a little while. At the meantime, we could do the broccoli. The broccoli has to cut to uh, little pieces, and we only take the tip, so it will be very fresh. 將啲切到西蘭花啦,就唔好切到太大嚿,係啱啱好,嚿嚿都唔上下,咁我有啲個心呢,將到有啲係細啲嘅,有啲大啲嘅,咁就將個心加一刀落去,等佢快啲熟。
Thank <laughs> you.